The first public library in the U.S. was built in Charlestown in 1698, the same year that the Tsar of Russia imposed a beard tax on its citizens. Hmm, books and beards. Now there's a name for a show. I am Evo Terra, and this is the Books and Beer Hangout. Welcome, everyone, to another riveting episode of Books and Beer. My name is Jeff Moriarty with ePublish Unum, and our topic today is ebooks and libraries. How is the world of digital publishing impacting the classical world of book lending? Our guest today is Daniel Messer, a cyberpunk librarian with the Maricopa County Library System. Daniel, please say hello. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you are drinking this fine evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Messer. I'm with the Maricopa County Library District. And tonight I'll be drinking coffee because talking about libraries and drinking beer is probably not a great idea for me. But uh, beyond that, I used to be a circulation manager. I've worked in libraries for 17, 18 years now. And now I'm a web developer and web content manager for the library district. So I manage not only their web content, but I also help out with ebooks, uh, the digital platforms, and all that kind of thing. Well, we'll let the, the uh, coffee slide, although I really would love to hear your drunken librarian stories. That sounds like, I mean, I'm sure you've seen some things in the stacks. Well, this evening I am drinking Sex Panther, a local brew. It's a, a double chocolate porter, and I think there's a little bit of brown chicken, brown cow in there as well. So, Eva, what you drinking? Well, say a silent prayer for the last of the Hop Slam. The last of the Hop Slam. Until next year, my Hop Slammy friends. I am so sorry, my friend. That is a truly, truly wonderful beer. Mm -hmm. All right. Daniel, question. Getting, you know, ebooks and libraries mm -hmm. like magnets. How do they even work? Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I shouldn't have gone there. Sorry. No, it's okay. Now, how, how do ebooks uh, work in libraries? What, uh, readers are allowed and what's the process if you want to check out a book? Well, it depends on the service. Right now, sort of the big he bull in uh, digital library lending is a service called Overdrive. Um, in the Valley here, we have a consortium with pretty much every library system in Maricopa County uh, to share out a digital collection via Overdrive. Um, the, ba the way it basically works, just in a nutshell, is it's tied to a digital collection and it's based on a traditional library model. So even though it's e-materials, we only buy the licenses or the copies, if you will, for a certain number. So just like if you go into a library and all the James Pattersons are checked out, you go into the digital collection and if we've only got 50 copies of the latest Patterson and they're all checked out, then you can't have any more. Um, basically it's tied to your library card and it works through either an app, and Overdrive makes an app for pretty much anything. I mean, you can get it for any tablet, uh, computers, Mac, PC, doesn't matter. And it uses Adobe Digital Editions in the background to sort of handle the digital rights management part of things. So, you know, good and bad there. The other sort of model that we're also seeing that the Maricopa County Library District does use is one called Freedom. Now, Freeding doesn't have the New York Times best-selling popular authors. It's sort of a more esoteric collection. It also uses ADE, but the difference between Freeding and Overdrive is Freeding is basically used by a paper download cycle. So there's never a waiting list for a book. All the stuff in the Freeding system is always available and always ready to check out. So those are sort of the two models we're seeing right now. Oh, okay, Point Dexter. Hang on a minute. Let me let me back <laughs> you up. That's great for the tech geeks out there, but I have a, an old school Kindle. Okay. Can I read books? Can you I read ebooks from the library? Can. You certainly can. Unfortunately, uh, reading does not work with Kindle because it relies completely on Adobe Digital Editions, and Adobe Digital Editions and Amazon just do not work together. Uh, with Overdrive, however, we do have Kindle format books, 
and we tend to buy the same number of copies for each. So we'll have EPUB format that works on pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have the Kindle format, which works on any Kindle that you have from the old keyboard Kindle on up to the new Kindle Fire HD. So do I walk into the bookstore with my Kindle and say, I'd like to put a book on this, please? Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, the good news is, is that a Kindle is easier to use than most of the e-readers I run into. Um, my colleague and I just got done with about 30 hours of classes going throughout the valley teaching people how to use their e-readers. And of all the devices that we ever had problems with, the Kindle was very much on the low end of that spectrum. So with the overdrive system, uh, you get in with your library card, of course. You can find the items that you're after. Hopefully there's you know something checked in that you want. And when you go to get a Kindle format book, you are actually taken to Amazon.com because, of course, all Kindle flows through Amazon. And it will send it to your Kindle device, just like any other Amazon.com book. So if you're used to getting your books over the air via their whisper sync or things like that, that's it's the same delivery mechanism. So I don't have to go into the library. I do all of this through the library's website? You certainly can. As a matter of fact, we have a, uh, we have a name for that. We call them our virtual viewers, where they don't hardly ever come into the library except maybe every two years to renew their library card. Hmm. Intriguing. Yeah. So where do you see where do you see the future going with libraries and ebooks? Are they gonna get increasingly digital? Uh, are they gonna get more integrated? Is there a lot good developing or not to put too fine a point on it? You know, are libraries really going to have a role in the age of the 99 cent and the free ebook? Well, to kind of quote the Buzz Lightyear meme, it's lawsuits, lawsuits everywhere. I see that coming sooner or later. Back in the day, um, libraries were kind of instrumental in getting the right of first sale law put into effect because that's exactly how libraries sort of operate with physical books is the right of first sale. We can buy a book and then we can do anything we want with it um, as long as we of course do not copy it. Unfortunately with e-materials we don't have that luxury. We license the e-material, the e-book or whatever it is and then we have to play by either the vendor's rules or the publisher's rules, maybe both of their rules. And the publishers and the vendors don't always get along, and neither of them have the library's interests in mind. So what we're seeing right now, and what we'll probably see at least for the foreseeable future, is a situation where libraries want to give publishers money for books. But the publishers are so nervous about library patrons just willy-nilly copying these materials and pirating them and sharing them with their friends that they're very hesitant. As a matter of fact, um, I believe it's Random House. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Random House. Had a real scandal where they would sell e-materials to libraries, but it was like an exorbitant markup, like uh, a standard sort of hardback book that would cost maybe 25 bucks for the average person would cost a library a hundred dollars for the ebook and yeah their, their their philosophy if we wish to dignify it with that is that an ebook never wears out sooner or later the latest Patterson is going to wear out and we've right. got to throw it away and buy another copy of the Patterson right that's their philosophy. The only problem with that is is the latest Patterson wears out or not the you know two, three years down the road. It's James Patterson. He's pulled that lever and published that novel 60 or 70 times by then. No one wants that book anymore. We're not going to replace that book. We're going to buy something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the foreseeable future. In hopefully going forward, I see a lot of parallels between what the music industry faced and how basically Apple kind of whipped them into shape and said, look, people are just pirating your materials. You may as well sell through us and make some money. Mm -hmm. And finally, the music industry was sort of, kind of, but not yet really dragged kicking and screaming into the digital age. It's kind of what the publishers are going through. They're so afraid of piracy that they're putting all these digital rights management restrictions on things. 
And that's why it's so much easier to buy a book from Amazon or from Barnes and Noble for your device than it is to check it out from a library because the device isn't designed for that in the first place. Yeah, yeah. To me, I mean, I think the, the, the parallel kind of breaks down a little bit in the fact that for the longest time, it was easier to pirate music than it was to try and buy digital music. Mm -hmm. Today in the library, in, in the book world, uh, by and large, piracy isn't happening. It's so simple to go out and buy it. There is no need for that, that right. back door. So I think a lot of those fears are, are kind of unfounded, and hopefully they'll figure it out because I think the libraries are getting shut out of the cold. Yes. And yeah. you mentioned largely uh, fiction to this point. What about uh, reference books and, and other things? Is, are through the same feeds and models, or are you having a different experience over there? It's a kind of a different experience, and this kind of goes back to the Freeding model. We have some other um, ebook databases, uh, one through a large library and a bibliographic vendor called Gale. And there's two of them that we subscribe to at Maricopa County. They're uh, the Gale Virtual Reference Library and the Gale Travel Guides. And it's pretty much what it sounds like. Virtual reference is ebooks and PDFs of things like biographies, science reference, art reference, things like that. And they also work off the Freeding model that they are always available. They're always there. They're always online. In many cases, you don't even need the library card to access them. I believe we still have them as a freely open resource. It's just like so we're trying to mirror the model that where you can walk into a library and snag a dictionary off the shelf, you can come to our website and get that biographical listing of your favorite musicians or whatever. So there's that, and in some ways that works better in reference because reference books tend to be constantly updated. And the travel guides are a real example of that because, sure. you know, every year there's a new 2013 Amsterdam. Next year there'll be a 20. 14 Amsterdam. Will it be very different? No. Is it worth buying 16 copies, one for each branch? No. Let's just put it on the website. People can get it as they need it. And besides, what's easier, putting the Amsterdam travel guide on your device and taking it with you or taking the big, thick Amsterdam travel book with you from, you know, Frommers or Fodors or DK or whoever? Right. Yeah, that causes a difference. So I want to switch gears and talk less about from the library's point of view and more from an indie author's point of view since typically Excellent. listen to our show are indie authors and maybe they've got a family member that isn't into the whole um, buying of books and or maybe they're just a fantastic patron like my mother loves to get her books from the library she's a, she's an ebook reader and so she gets most of her ebooks from the library she doesn't buy them how do I as an indie author get my books in your library right now it's hard um, and it's partially it, this is partially the library's fault, not just our library or my library, but uh, the libraries as a whole. Absolutely. Libraries, yeah, libraries have what they call a collection development policy. And these policies were probably drawn up a good 15 to 20 years ago when the Internet was a command line, and <laughs> they do not translate well into the digital era. So, for instance, one of these policies quite often with many larger library systems is we, not, we will not buy a book unless it's been published by a major publisher, has a starred review in a major publishing or book review journal, or, you know, different criteria that there's no way an indie, indie author cannot manage. So that's going to have to change eventually. Exactly. And you've got people like me, a bunch of my friends, where we are working on changing that. Um, of course, the problem comes down to... Well, the problem comes down to two things. Number one, money, and the second one is rights. Um, if if we're going to basically start dealing with an indie author setup, which I would love to because there's a lot of good books out there that the big six will just not pick up, um, we need to either get some kind of model together, maybe some kind of vendor that makes it easy, or the libraries are quite simply going to have to do it themselves. And we're actually seeing this in a couple places. I, I want to say it's Boulder, but I'm not positive of that. That might be wrong. Um, is actually setting up basically their own ebook distribution system where they're taking in, you know, some of these indie authors that they normally wouldn't take in because in some cases they're just, you know, getting the books for free because the author wants that book in the library. Sure, sure. And... Right. 
just distributed it themselves. Now, what model I'll they tell you use? What, Dan, I'm going I'm to interrupt you for a quick second here. Sure, we'll sure. take it up on for the folks listening live or watching live. Great, we're going to finish this conversation. If you're watching it uh, leftovers, huh? Eh, sorry, send us an email and we'll tell you what you missed. Uh, but great conversation so far, Dan. Thank you very Thank much you. for joining us today. And uh, for all of you out there, hey, guess what? Uh, I wrote a book. Yay! And since you are here watching or listening to the show, why that means you are automatically in the target audience. It's called, uh, what's it called again? Oh yeah, Writing Awesome Sales Copy. And yeah, that sounds a little weird, but it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, Smashwords, you name it, you should really go out and buy that. So, uh, information about Dan and all of his stuff will be on our website, which is at booksandbeer.com. The Books and Beer Hangout is a publication. No, it's a production of e Publish Unum. We help authors survive and thrive in a digital world. For education, classes, all sorts of great stuff, check us out at epublishunum.com. For Jeff Moriarty, I'm Evo Terra. Thanks for watching the show.